great uh, pleasure and honor for me to, to end this wonderful conference. I'm very grateful to uh, David, Joe, and Elise who really um, put the background on, on future because otherwise what I will present now would have seemed really silly. Um, I think also it's, um, it's quite nice that I end this conference by trying to bring perspective in the far future as much as big history brings perspective uh, for the last 14 billion years. So what really drives me, what really interests me in cosmic evolution is the rise of complexity. I'm fascinated by, by this uh, complexity and where it could lead us. And that's what I want to, to explore with you today. So you might think 14 billion years is a long time, but actually it represents, uh, well, from the Big Bang to um, about 20 billion years uh, from, uh, in the future, it represents only 0.03%, not of the whole uh, diagram, but of this part of cosmic evolution, which is called the Stelliferous Era, and which represents in this diagram 100 billion years. So the Stelliferous Era is simply the era in cosmic evolution where there are stars. All the rest afterwards, it's the decay of everything, the heat death of the universe which, which starts. So the heat death of the universe, as uh, David um, talked about, David Christian talked about two, uh, two days ago, is really the ultimate problem that any intelligent life will have to, to deal with. So first, uh, we'll have the, the sun that will die in about five billion years. So you can say, yeah, easy, we take a spaceship, we go to another star. But this other star will, all, will also exhaust its fuel. And, uh, and so you, you could go and hope, hope to all stars of the galaxy. But um, then you could say, yes, but there are new stars which are forming. So we could do this kind of infinitely. But if you look at the galaxy as an, uh, as an ecosystem, it will also, uh, the, the rate of star, star formation will decrease and new star formation will also stop. Well, there are about uh, 170 billion galaxies in the universe, so you could try to play this game if you manage to reach other galaxies. But it's not um, sustainable in the long term and the heat death will win in the long term. So I assume you've all taken the Coursera courses and you've graduated uh, to know the past 14 billion years for the big, from the Big Bang stars to new chemical elements, planets, life, humans, agriculture, and the Anthropocene. So what I'm interested in uh, here is to see what could happen in the next 14 billion years and to explore what could happen in the next centuries, millennia, million years, and billion years, and to see what could be the, the thresholds there. So for my exploration, I will use two scales of development. The Kar Kardashev scale that Joe told you about, which is simply the assumption that we will continue to increase our energy consumption. And the Barrow scale, which is um, our ability to manipulate smaller and smaller scales. So to go to control smaller scales. And if you think about it, it's, it's really the driver of almost all, all our great technological advances today. The computer, nanotechnologies, biotechnologies. Interestingly, um, we are more or less, we are in a transition, transition phase um, between a type one society on Kardashev scale, so able to master the whole energy of the planet, to uh, a type two, able to master the energy of the, of the sun. And on evolutionary time scale, it's a, it's a very short transition. Uh, on the x, x axis, it's, uh, you have um, time in millions of years. So the Barrow scale, it's the ability to, to do technologies at smaller and smaller scales. 
And if you look at the, the, the limits from physics, we are just really at the beginning of technology. We, are, we, are, we have developed uh, technological artifacts at our own scale, such as a, a hammer or a hacks. Um, we have micro technologies. We are currently developing nanotechnologies, but in principle, there is no reason that we couldn't continue and develop pico technology, femto technology, ato technology, zepto technology, yocto technology. Well, uh, be careful, those names are not official afterwards. Xocto technology, vocto technology, vocto technology, and finally, plank technology. So, as Richard Feynman, the, the great physicist, said, there is plenty of room at the bottom. There is a huge potential to organize matter and energy on very small scales. So, we are, of course, biased um, to think about the future uh, by what old Hollywood movies tell us, such as humanoid uh, super intelligent robots and artificial intelligence. I don't think it will happen. Instead, what is happening is IA, so intelligence augmentation. What we are constantly doing with our smartphones, with our technology, is to augment <coughs> ourselves. So it's a real symbiosis between humans and technology which is happening. It's not robots versus us. We all uh, like our smartphones and are addicted to it. So we, we really are building a symbiosis with our technology. And in this example, um, we, can, we can predict that in the near future, the interface of augmented reality will be integrated in our glasses or even contact lenses. And they would bring us um, information about, um, about the, our surrounding. And this is really a kind of distributed intelligence. It's not just one robot which has all the intelligence. We have the rating of the restaurants, which are uh, computed thanks to, to other users who, who were there. So we are using the knowledge of others to, to increase our intelligence. And you have also the algorithm which filter for you maybe what's mo most relevant because you, you want to see only the Thai food restaurant, so it will already filter uh, what you can see because of your preferences. So to the limit, um, <coughs> I propose a special line is the global brain. So it's a, a distributed intelligent network of humans and machines which communicate through the internet. And my PhD supervisor, uh, Francis Heiligen, has written a paper where he um, provocatively, a, a bit provo provocatively, um, say that the global brain re will bring practical versions of the God attributes. Omniscience, it means to be able to answer any question. If you think about Google, type in your question, most of the time you will, you will find an answer. It's already quite amazing, it's almost working, at least if you are not a scientist and have difficult problems to solve. <laughs> Omnipresence, the internet is more and more accessible everywhere. Omnipotence, the ability to solve any problem or to, to create anything. This could be achieved in the not so far future with 3D printers which, can, which could provide any object or any, any material thing where it's needed. And finally, omnibenevolence, which is <clears throat> probably more problematic that the, the network would want uh, the good for, and the happiness of everybody. So what will happen the next millennia? Well, as suggest, um, although I, I strongly believe that uh, symbiosis between humans and machines will last for a long time, in the longer term, uh, I think it's technological, it, there will be the birth of a new kind of life, technological life, that we are witnessing a transition comparable to the origin of life itself. And this will happen when um, technological artifacts will 
perform all the functions of life, but more efficiently. So, for example, they will be faster than biological life. They will be space-proof if we want to, to explore other um, areas of our solar system or beyond, and be able to withstand high temperatures. So climate change, for example, wouldn't be a problem for, for te technological life. The next million years, so the real problem then becomes solar change or the red giant phase of the sun. Uh, that's what planet Earth will look like in about one billion years. So here is a, a solution to solar change. <laughs> Try to escape it. It's a little game which is called Escape the Red Giant. <laughs> so I tried to play it. It's a real recording of me playing. <laughs> didn't work for me. So, um, David Greenspoon said there, there are two options, either to, to move away or to try to fix the problem. So let's, let's see the other solution to fix the problem. These three researchers are, are personal heroes of mine. H Hubert Reeves, Martin Beach, and David Criswell. Why? Because they are st what is called stellar engineers. They have devised ways to modify our sun in order to delay its red giant phase. So I can warmly recommend you um, this book by, by Martin Beach from 2008, which is called Rejuvenating the Sun and Avoiding Other Global Catastrophes. So how, how do you do this? Um, actually, it might be easier than geoengineering because ultimately uh, the sun is a simpler system than the Earth. So one way to do it is to put um, solar-powered accelerators around the sun to create a very strong magnetic field, which would um, create a mass outflow which would strip some mass of, uh, out of the sun. And therefore, um, physics tells us that one, one way to, to delay the red giant phase is to just get rid of some of the mass of the sun. I think it's great, but there is something which I find shameful, is that, is that this energy would be wasted. It would, we would just throw it away in space. So I would like to add to this uh, the next threshold, which is planetary accretion, not in the, t in the planetary science uh, sense, but in, uh, in the sense that we would move the Earth closer to the orbit, uh, to, closer to the, to, to the Sun, and, and start to, to do this and, and collect at the same time the energy. So here we are talking really about, it's, if you would like, it's a variation on the Dyson sphere idea, in that instead of putting collectors everywhere, you, you collect energy in a more concentrated form, uh, on the Earth. So it would requir require moving the Earth out of its orbit and uh, post-biology, because of course no life as we know it would survive being very near uh, the Sun. So it's a kind of win-win solution. The Sun lives longer and we have more energy. Great. So what comes next? Next billion years? Um, so here now I will I will start to 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 speak about astrobiology, high energy astrobiology. So some speculations that I I have about advanced extraterrestrial uh, life. A first introduction to uh, uh, to binary systems, binary star systems. There are um, three kinds of uh, of binary star systems. So these are simply two stars uh, orbiting each other, the, the detached binaries. They just orbit, they, do, they don't in, um, exchange matter or energy. They are the binaries which are in contact, which form a, a com common envelope. 
And uh, so it's like a wildfire. They, they, they exchange energy very, very quickly and they are not long lived. But interestingly, there, there are bin a few binaries which are in between these two states where there is a, a mass transfer from one companion star to the other, which is irregular. And here are some uh, images, some artistic depiction of, uh, of these um, systems, where here, for example, the, the energy is channeled through magnetic, powerful magnetic field. Here there is a, an accretion disk, and here it's called an accretion curtain. So the, the, it's an accretion disk plus a very strong magnetic field, which kind of repulses the, the, the flow. And so when I was um, extrapolating the Kardashev scale and the Barrow scale, I was imagining that a civilization would use the energy of a star and would be in a very dense state, uh, having technologies at very small scales. And so uh, I was speculating that black holes would be the ultimate attractors of intelligence. And when I, 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 I was just... Um, and, and then I went through the liter astrophysics literature, and then I saw that black holes are actually found in systems like this, at least stellar black holes. And what there is here is, uh, when I saw this, I, I thought, whoa, this looks like a metabolism. There is energy going from the, com uh, the companion star until, uh, to the dense object, there are jets of matter which are ejected from the, the black hole, at, so, so it's open thermodynamically. And the most intriguing thing is that the, the flow of energy from the companion star to, to the black hole is irregular. So it seems that there is an energy budgeting, which is also a, a fundamental feature of life. If, if you think about it, if we would eat constantly, we would die. If we would not eat at all, we would die also. So we need the right amount of food to, to remain alive. So I call them uh, stellivores, or star eaters, uh, if you prefer English. <laughs> and um, so in the galaxy, there are about uh, 1,500 uh, such systems where instead of the black hole, it's a white dwarf, which accretes energy from, from its companion star. A white dwarf um, is about the size of the Earth. So here it would require a depletion of the first parent star. So then finding and navigating to another single star and channeling plasma through powerful magnetic field. And here the, the entropy is exported uh, through NOVA, NOVA. Uh, which are not supernova. Supernova uh, are total expl explosions of the star, so the, the system is destroyed. No, in novae, the, the system recovers uh, its, its state that it was in before. So to give you just an idea, uh, in this system, the, depending on the accretion rate, it would take about one billion years to, to hit the sun. The next threshold, 13, is actually similar to, to white dwarf accretion, except it's a neutron star, so it's a much higher density uh, state of matter. Um, here you probably don't see it, but a neutron star is the size of uh, the laser pointer, more or less. And the accretion in these systems is uh, 700 times more efficient than with white dwarfs. And it would take about 600 million years to hit the sun. Finally, black hole accretion. It requires it's a, it's a, the most dense state of matter. It would require Planck technology, so the ultimate level in the Barrow scale. And uh, interestingly, physicists have shown that accretion into a black hole is 50 times more efficient than nuclear fusion. So 50 times more efficient than the nuclear fusion which occurs in stars. It's absolutely amazing. And it would take about 4 million years to hit uh, the sun at this rate. 
Here it's a picture of the galaxy in, um, in the gamma ray energy. Um, what you see here is, a, is an asymmetry at the center of the galaxy, uh, which is a, a long stand uh, problem in astrophysics. And um, these researchers have proposed that, well, yes, I should say that this um, trace is at 511 kilo electron volt, kilo electron volt, and it's actually the signature of um, electron position annihilation. And what they have uh, proposed is that it's actually due to binary systems that I showed you, the kind of binary systems that I showed you. So here the speculation is that uh, steady rows would do 100% efficiency matter energy conversion. Okay, so let's go back to empirical uh, data. How do they rate according to the energy rate density? If you take the Earth from outside, uh, it's, it's, it has an energy rate density of about 0.0001 erg per second per gram. And um, a stellivore is about ten, has a value of about 10,000. So here we have eight orders of magnitude difference between um, Earth as a, as a system and stellivores. So to me it's very intriguing because I was already um, a fan of Eric Chesson's uh, complexity metric. And when I saw that the system had very high values, uh, I was very intrigued and I still, I still am. So what, uh, what it's all about, it's not just about um, eating stars. It's, remember, it's about escaping the, the heat death of the universe. And so one idea to escape the heat death is actually to make a new universe. And so therefore, the, the second law of thermodynamics would be reset in this new universe, and heat death would be bypassed. So now I will give you <laughs> 30 seconds of reflection, and um, I want you to imagine how a, a stellivore would reply to this philosophical question, what's it all about in this context? Okay, anyone, any idea? All right, I give you the answer. It's your viral produce. <laughs> <laughs> Each stars survive the heat death and reproduce the universe. So that's a summary, of, that's the main slide of my talk. I could have said everything with this. Um, so let's go back to Earth and see what lessons we, we can learn. For me, the lesson is very clear that solar energy is the future. So this amount of, if you see the, the global energy potential, Um, even this amount of energy, 23,000 terawatts, is the amount of energy which goes uh, after it's filtered by the, the Earth's atmosphere. And the total output uh, of the sun is about 10 billion times uh, more than this. So we would have to, to, to draw a circle 10, 10 billion times bigger than this to really um, appreciate the power of the sun. So I've been very, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've depicted a very pale picture of uh, the future on using only energy and scale. But of course there is also the moral, the ethical uh, way of this, perspective on this. And so in the same way that um, small groups of people where, when, when before globalization, they couldn't care about planet Earth, and we can't blame them for that, because they, they were not aware uh, of global problems. Maybe there were less global problems also. Um, but so now I think with this conference and generally in the world, we, we are getting more and more aware uh, of 
global problems, and this is, I think, uh, a magnificent transition that we are witnessing. But there is no reason that it, stop, that it would stop at planet Earth. I predict that we, we, would, we will care about the sun in the future, about its longevity, and possibly about galaxies or the universe itself uh, avoiding, uh, avoiding the, the heat death. So in, in conclusion, to sum up, uh, the <coughs> nine new thresholds that I propose are the global brain, the merging of humans with their technology, then the birth of technological life, then accretion, so planetary accretion, white dwarf accretion, neutron star accretion, black hole accretion, then mastering the ultimate source of energy uh, in the universe, which is matter and energy, matter, uh, sorry, 100% uh, efficiency in matter and energy conversion through uh, electron positron annihilation. And finally, this to make a Big Bang 2.0 a new universe to escape heat death. So to me, uh, the next 14 billion years looks, look quite exciting. Let's start our big future adventure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.